Okay, uh, yeah, as I said, my name is John Lohr. I work for a small startup called Joya Communications. Uh, we build a video chat app called Marco Polo. Uh, it's, it's got, a, I don't know, a couple million users now. Uh, we aren't really talking too much about the stats, but we do a fair amount of traffic, and uh, it's a pretty exciting and fun project to work on. Uh, we built all of our infrastructure on top of Redis, and so I have a lot of experience. Uh, and I wanted to share some of that with you. I entitled this Pain-Free Pipelining. Uh, I'm a wimp when it comes to pain. I don't really like it. One of my earliest memories is uh, stepping on a mesquite thorn. I grew up in Texas. Has any of you seen a mesquite thorn before? Yeah, okay, I see one person. They're long, they're really big. And I stepped on it and it broke off in the bottom of my foot. And that was bad. The worst part was I lived out in a ranching community and one of the, the ranchers that drove by in his pickup truck saw everybody standing out in my front lawn, like, I, I can take care of that, and he pulled out fencing pliers. And I don't know if you know what fencing pliers look like, but they're, they look like um, a hammerhead shark jaws, so big, big things. And he's trying to pull the thorn out that had broken off in, the, in my foot. And, uh, <laughs> He didn't get it out, so I had to go to the, to the emergency room and they pulled it out with some tweezers. Um, but anyway, yeah, I don't like pain, um, and so I don't like seeing other people who are in the middle of pain either, and so I would like to, to share this with you as well. Uh, I am a father of three, and when my firstborn son um, was born, I was in the delivery room with my wife, and I'm the guy who passed out and fell backwards. I held my breath because I, I just couldn't stand my wife being in, in pain. And then, of course, all the doctors and nurses come running around me because I'm passed out on the floor. <laughs> Are you okay? And my wife is like, oh, I can't believe this. So uh, hopefully I will do a little bit better job helping you through your experience of pipelining. How many people here uh, have used Redis pipelining yet? Yeah, we got a fair number of people, but equally uh, as many who may not have used it. So I will go over what the concept is and um, hopefully talk a little bit about uh, what you can do to make it easier. Because um, for those of you who have tried it, especially as you build more complex applications that, and try to take advantage of pipelining, it becomes more and more difficult. And we'll get into that shortly, hopefully. So what is pipelining? That's, you know, it's not the, <laughs> it's, it's not an oil pipeline. It's, it's similar to HTTP pipelining, if you've heard of that, like in HTTP 1.1, where you send a request, you don't wait for a reply, you send another request and another request, and then the replies come back in a batch so that you only have to make one network round trip. So um, in Redis, that looks like, here's a, uh, the difference between a single versus an, a pipeline uh, command. So you send an increment command, the server replies back one. You send another increment command, you get reply back to. Those are each network round trips. You keep on going, same thing. When you pipeline, you say, I want to do operations one, two, three, send as one network round trip, and then you get one response back from the server all in one batch, ideally, um, if, you've, if you've buffered them. Now, there's different ways of going about this. Different clients implement it slightly differently, but roughly, that's, that's the goal. The goal is to send a batch of commands to the server and get them all back. Um, why would you want a pipeline? Why not just use Redis, send a command and get a response back? And the, the answer is round trip time. So the problem is when you send a command to the server, if your server is really close, then you know, and your network's really fast, then you'll get an answer back really fast. But if you're in a data center where your round trip latency is a millisecond or half a millisecond, 
then those start to add up. And if your application can't withstand those kinds of latencies, if you need it to be quick, um, then, then you will look for opportunities. Uh, if you were here at the training session, um, maybe a few of you were yesterday, Salvatore gave a really good talk about pipelining and why you should use it. It not only has benefits from the round trip um, standpoint for your application, but also on the server. And, it, and he gave a really good explanation of why that is, because when you batch the commands to the server, a big part of what the server has to do is take those, request, those commands and parse them, um, read it from the, the kernel buffer into user space, process the commands, and then, and then re return a response. And you can get much more throughput on your server, regardless of how you've implemented your client, if the commands are pipelined than not. So um, it's a good idea if you can accomplish it. Um, so, you know, you, you say, all right, well, do I need this? Let me run a quick benchmark and see. And if you run it on localhost, you like fire it up and you're like, boom. Okay, well, I, I send them one at a time. So I'm sending single requests. But if I pipeline, then I can get a ton more of throughput. Um, so the example here that I ran on my laptop, and you can, you can easily do this on your own. Can anybody read? The, the fine print there, that's the command. I probably should have made that part the big part, but it's just running the Redis benchmark with uh, the command get and a C for concurrency of one. Um, so if you pipeline the commands, you can get many, many more commands through. And then you say, all right, well, so what? 17,000 commands per second sounds pretty good to me. <laughs> I don't need to get 260. Um, commands per second out of my application, so why, why should I bother, right? Um, the answer is because the loopback address does not equal production environments. And if you start modeling that out, you can either spin up um, you know, in, on EC2 or wherever you're gonna do your production environment, you, and I encourage you actually to do that, but you can very cheaply sim, uh, simulate what it's like to run on your production environment using a pretty cool tool that I just discovered not too long ago called ToxyProxy, uh, built by people at Shopify. Uh, I haven't ever met anyone, but you know something about that? <laughs> oh, okay, all right, well, great. I, here is uh, one very grateful person who has used this product. It also is really great for simulating outages, um, other kinds of things in your, in your local environment where you need to test and say, does my application handle it if suddenly this Redis, Redis database goes away? What, what does it do? Um, and can it degrade gracefully? How does it handle the errors? So uh, pretty cool to use. Um, and I'm realizing you guys will not be able to read this at all. but. Uh, you can certainly look up the documentation for ToxyProxy if you Google, Google it. And the, the concept is you, you say, all right, where's my Redis database? What, what's the, the source? And then I'll create a destination on localhost or something else, a listening port. Um, and then I can add um, what they call toxics. And basically what it means is, is say, all right, I want to taint this in some way. I can create network jitter. I can just create pure latency. I can cause it to intermittently fail or other things like that. Um, so in this case, what I'm simulating is make the network behave like there's one millisecond latency. Now, in EC2, where I run my production environment, uh, you know, we're working in multi-availability zones in the same data center, and that the, the actual latency is anywhere between, um, you know, a quarter of a millisecond to half a millisecond, something like that, and sometimes, but there, there's, you know, the, the distribution of that curve, and, you know, you can certainly get, get something that approaches one millisecond or even two milliseconds latency. It's not that uncommon, so it, you, you should check your own environment. But um, so what happens though is now when I have a one millisecond latency, if I'm 
every single second, I can only process 216 commands, which if you think about it, like, okay, maybe your application only needs to make one call to Redis. And so you're like, okay, well, I, I still don't care. And if, if that's you, then uh, get up and go ahead and walk out of the room. <laughs> For me, I do a lot with Redis and I have a lot of different operations that I have to do, including statistical counters and other things that as you build up your application, the more complexity arises. So um, if I pipeline though, now I'm getting into the range where I, you know, I, I still I pay that round trip time, but I can get much more through than I actually need to for each individual request so that each individual request that I'm serving up um, can be within a, uh, my desired latency for the, the total API request latency. So when you first look at this, you think, okay, I'm running this on localhost and I benchmark my code and I start looking at it and I, I say, well, most of the time is being sent in the CPU, not in the network. But when you switch to measuring a production environment setup, you'll see that a lot of the time, most of your latency when you profile is actually spent in waiting for stuff to come around. And so um, depending on how much of a fanatic you are about this kind of thing, it, it can make a, a big difference. So if you are doing you know, 50 or 60 or 70 Redis round trips, that can easily add up to a second or two seconds. And um, depending on how your application is designed, you may not want to make those kinds of trade-offs. You may want to do something that's a little more efficient. So um, then there's also the, the added benefit to the server, right? You can get way more throughput and, uh, on your individual Redis server nodes if you're running Redis cluster, which we do, um, by pipelining than not. So yay, pipelines, all right. Have I sold you? Yeah. <laughs> OK, all right, let's do pipelining. But here's the problem that I ran into, and for those of you who have tried pipelining, you will most likely run into as well. The issue is that your encapsulation of your logic starts to bleed out as you write pipelines, especially when you're trying to, to combine multiple elements together in a single pipeline request. So if I need to increment some statistical counters, and then I also have a different module that is preparing a post to, um, to store a message or something else, and I could do those in parallel, but they're written in different logical components, how do I share the pipeline without one or other ones knowing what the other one is doing? And I've written a lot of spaghetti code. <laughs> I know probably if you're a software developer, maybe you have two and it's not a great feeling to write it, but we all kind of do it. We're like, oh, well, maybe for performance gains or whatever else, um, I will go ahead and do this, but um, there's gotta be a better way. And so that's what I set out to, to try to discover. And through a lot of pain, personal pain, <laughs> um, I did discover some patterns that hopefully will be very easy for you to apply. Now, we are a Python shop, but the patterns that I've used here, and hopefully I will be able to explain them simply enough, can be easily ported. The library is not very big. Uh, it's pretty well documented. So if you wanted to, to borrow the concepts and, and write your own port, uh, you're welcome to do so. And I would encourage you to. I can also jump in and help if you, if you would like. So anyway. Um, I was just going to say the, the, the other pain point with pipelining is that usually the API looks kind of similar to pi pipelining calls to the, to the regular Redis API in the clients that you use, but they're slightly different. And it means a lot of fine tuning and refactoring. And hopefully I can make it so that when you talk to Redis, you, whether it's a single call or a pipeline call, you don't even have to think about it. And hopefully you can build encapsulation logic in your code that will be able to make a call as if it's a single call, but optionally accept uh, another parent object that says, hey, if you can, combine it with this other one. So that's the goal. Uh, another way to solve the same kind of problem, 
instead of pipelining would be to do everything asynchronously, right? So you could open up 20 different, if I have 20 calls that I need to make to Redis, I can open 20 different connections, I can fire off all of them in parallel and get the answers back. Um, and unfortunately, Redis is, um, you know, a, a blocking API. It's not like WebSockets or something like that where, where you open multiple streams over a single TCP and multiplex them that way. So you, you would really be talking to Redis over multiple connections and doing them in parallel. You also, if you do that pattern, it certainly could work. Uh, and in Node.js or some other programming language, it might be really easy. Uh, for Python, Less so, I mean, there are certainly asynchronous patterns that you can use. Uh, not many people employ them, um, except for, gosh, well, there's a number of different libraries. Um, Tornado client, um, fans are, are uh, sure to push, and, and they can do amazing things as well. But you're still kind of working with the concept of a single call going to the server and coming back um, over one single TCP IP connection, and so now you are multiplying the number of connections that you need to talk to Redis to be able to do that kind of concurrency, raising the load on your Redis server. So hopefully you can figure out ways of being able to combine those and trunk them back down. Another strategy that you might use is, is say, all right, well, I'll run 2M proxy or Nutcracker as it's sometimes called. Uh, it's kind of stale, but, but the idea is I run it on localhost or something like that, and so I talk to localhost 2M proxy, which maps that to the actual Redis server, and it, it can, um, based on all of the traffic that's running there or on another host, it trunks them down, all of those requests, so that they go to the server as a single outbound request. So that'd be another way to solve it. I'm not suggesting that this is the only way to solve it. I'm just giving you some some options. So here's what it comes down to for me. To make this easier, we actually have to make it a little bit harder. Uh, and this was my um, paradigm shift right here. Pipeline everything or build all of my code as if it could be combined and be pipelined with something else. Um, how many of you have seen this picture? Anyone recognize it? There's a, quite a few. It's a pretty common picture. Um, the great thing about this picture is that it illustrates two ways of seeing the exact same photo. So some people see a young woman in the photo, and some people see an old lady. And if you study it carefully, maybe you can see both. How many people see both? All right, good, yeah. You can see the, the necklace that goes across is also the lips of the old lady, so that's kind of like your and then the, the chin line is, is the nose and up, up to the face. So, so you can see it both ways. And, and a paradigm shift it, it really works like that. It's like, how can I look at this problem and see it in a different way? And for me, that was, that was the key. So after years of misery and struggling, <laughs> um, here's where, where I ended up. You can use this module. It's called Red Pipe. Not a very imaginative name, Redis pipeline, red pipe. Um, so check it out. It, you can pip install it if you use Python. If you don't use Python, you can certainly read through the code. It's not a very long read. And there's lots of documentation on read the docs. So I encourage you to check it out. Uh, the goal for this was to keep the API very similar to Redis Pi. So it's very similar to how uh, Redis, the, the Redis Pi client library already works, and it is actually a wrapper around it. The difference is, um, is that with Redis Pi pipelines, you have to wait for the response until you can consume the data set. So you make the API call, um, you know, and then it re returns queued or something like that on the server if you were doing it that way. But, but Redis Pi actually makes you, you issue the command and you get none in response. So if I do um, pipeline increment foo, I get none in response and I call another one and another one and then I call pipeline execute. And pipeline execute returns an array. The problem with that is that I can no longer encapsulate that. I need to know the result from that execute 
whatever it is, and I can't easily combine it with other chunks of logic. So, Redpipe <laughs> returns futures instead. So when you do pipeline increment, it gives you back a representation of that that you can use, but you have to wait until pipeline execute has happened. And so there's a few slights of hand that you can use, but basically it become, that object that it returns is indistinguishable, hopefully, if I've done my job right, from the actual end result of the pipeline. So if you call it before, it'll raise an exception, but after the execute happens, you can look at it and that object behaves like an int. You can add, you can subtract, you can, you can do anything uh, with it. You can, if, it's, if it returns a dictionary, you, know, you can iterate through all of the elements. If it's a list, you know, it handles all of the different data types. And the way it works is that when I queue a command into Redpipe, which is this client library, I pass back a reference and I check the position uh, of what that reference is pointing to. And then when I do my final pipeline execute, I pass that result back into the reference and then the reference can use that. So the whole point of this is to be able to build modular components and still be able to pipeline. Um, and for us, where we use Redis for, <clears throat> for everything, for all kinds of different things, um, it was really efficient to be able to com combine lots of modular pieces um, in reusable ways and still take advantage of pipelining. So, oh, I think I mostly covered that. Um, so as I said, yeah, you use them like the real thing. Um, it takes advantage of duct typing. It's, it's basically, yes, it is an object that's returned from, from Redpipe um, called a future object, but as long as you expect it to be an int and you treat it like an int, it's going to behave exactly like an int. So, um, you know, I can do comparisons greater than, less than, uh, add to it. Um, I can iterate all of the different things that you might, you might do with the different data types. <clears throat> So then the next concept that, that you might say is, well, well, great, I've got this reference here, but I can't really do anything with it until after pipeline executes. So what use is it, right? Because now I've got a, a reference, but if I call it inside my function, then it just blows up. So I can't really do anything, but actually you can if you build a closure. So if you build a closure and then say, attach it to the, the execute method that says, when this pipeline executes, also do this bit of logic. Now you get a whole nother level of power that you can build object-oriented behaviors out of that so that you can pass in a pipeline into your object-oriented um, interface and then do a number of different options, uh, do a number of different arguments or op operations. Sorry, my brain is, yeah. Um, <laughs> do a number of different operations, and then when the callback fires, um, after the pipeline has executed outside the scope of this function, then I can populate properties into my object-oriented thing or do other business logic that I might need to do so that I can continue to use that. So um, Redpipe also supports the idea of nesting pipelines, so I can pass one pipeline into another, into another, as I go down the stack, and it passes its arguments and callbacks up the chain until the top level and then finally executes. Um, and this becomes a very useful pattern. Um, if you pass in none, so there's, a, there's an argument called, um, I think it's just called red pipe pipeline, and you pass in an argument. If that argument is none, then when you call execute on that, it will um, instantaneously send that out. But if you pass in a pipeline, another pipeline, then it queues all of those commands and passes it up the chain. Um, and so it's, it's turtles all the way down, as they say. Um, so I also built into this library key spaces. And the way key spaces work, if you've manipulated Redis at all, and it's a fairly common pattern, is you have your user objects, and they might be hashes or something like that. And they all start with the same key prefix, and then they have the, the data value. And 
oftentimes they're wrapped in curly braces. This is especially useful if you use Redis cluster or either the open source version or the Redis Labs version. Um, they both support the idea that if you have the, the item in the middle between the curly braces of your string is the same, even though the outside elements are different, they will map to the same node and that increases your performance because when, let's say I have a, a user and a user stats and they're two different objects, but they both share the user ID as a common item inside the key, each of those two keys. And if I pipeline both of those, they both wind up on the same node, which means that if I'm talking to Redis cluster, I don't have to make two different network round trips. I don't have to hit two different nodes to get the answer back. Um, speaking of Redis cluster, Redpipe also supports uh, Redis cluster as well. So if you are using Redis cluster at all and you want to try pipelining, it works completely uh, naturally. So, uh, and the way it does it is because Redpipe just wraps whatever thing you, you pass into it it wraps the uh, pipeline or the, the client object itself and uses its pipeline method, kind of more duct typing, where it's basically, okay, if it behaves this according to these certain interfaces, I don't care if it's the Redis cluster client or the, the Red Pi, uh, Redis Pi uh, client, either way. So with key spaces, you define your different data types. Uh, you, you can work with strings, lists, sets, hashes, sorted sets, hyperlog log. The geo one is still in progress because Redis Pi didn't fully support it yet uh, in the production release. They're, they're in progress there too. So, so full-fledged support is still in progress there, but um, it, it's easy enough to, to put in. Actually, I could have completed it. I just chose not to because we don't use any uh, geolocation searching in, in our applications and because Redis Pi doesn't yet fully support it, um, but will soon, and as soon as it does, I'll, I'll go ahead and add that. Um, you can also specify a connection. So you can give each connection that you assign in Redpipe a name and then be able to um, from your key space, be able to say, all right, this is connection A, this is connection B, or, or this is our user's Redis database, and this is our message's Redis database, if you've vertically partitioned your data according to different things. And Redpipe will automatically know that it's talking to different Redis databases and process them in different threads and call them uh, asynchronously. So it figures out all of those details for you automatically. Uh, the cool thing about key spaces that I really like uh, and that we use a lot, this is just an added bonus and not necessarily an intrinsic property of it, but, but it's, it's pretty nice, is if you know the key space, you usually know the fields or the data types, and so you can map those. And so um, if you're using a hash, for example, and you have a certain field that's always a Boolean, of true false or something like that, rather than just doing a JSON blob and, and encoding it, you can actually use JSON, uh, use Redis hashes and encode it and decode those things. Uh, other things like, um, you know, whether or not it is a UTF-8 encoded string, or if it's an ASCII, ASCII characters, is it encoded in UTF-8 and then pulled back out? All of that happens uh, transparently and automatically for you. Um, so there's a number of different ones that I support um, and you can write your own as well. Um, Booleans, ints, floats, lists, and dictionaries are all, all supported as sub-elements of a hash. Um, the, and, and as I said, yeah, you can write your own. Um, the, to write your own is really, really simple. So, um, but I would be curious about the use cases that, that you that you have as well, because we could add native support for them as well in Redpipe. Um, structs are, are really interesting as well. They allow you to manipulate Redis like a dictionary. Um, so one thing that we often do with, uh, with uh, our, our data model as well is, is create 
an, a more object-oriented interface rather than, than calling H set blah, blah, blah. You know, I have a list of properties that I want to pass into an object. Um, I have some defaults that I might want to set up. I have um, the ability to, to read and see if the, the data is there and maybe update some fields if I want to. Um, tell which fields have changed and only mutate those, uh, things like that, or, or be able to set um, those values optionally. If they already exist, I don't want to change them, so things like that. Um, so be sure to check that out as well. All right, so this is, this is normal Redis Pi code. Um, this is an example that, that helps illustrate my case. Right, so when I'm doing my pipeline increment with my key, and then I want to say maybe expire the key, um, and then do it on a different key and execute, now look at the results that comes back, and I need to know, not only do I need to have that, those results, but I need to be able to, to know where they are positionally in that re returned result. And if the, the order of operations changes, suddenly my application can break and it becomes very brittle. So red pipe is, is designed to, to solve that problem. So here is how you actually connect to red pipe. Um, you, you can import Redis and instantiate it. The normal arguments there in, to Redis dot Redis or strict Redis, it actually doesn't matter. Both of them work equally well work the same, so you do all of your setup and connection the way you would normally. And the advantage of being able to do, do it this way and then pass it into red pipe is that you can, you can incrementally change your application. So you can leave your current factory method of instantiation for Redis as it is, just grab it wherever it is and pass it to red pipe and then start refactoring using red pipe in certain situations and and still reuse all of your connection pooling, everything else. You don't have to have duplicate connections at all. Um, if, if you have a Redis cluster client, it works exactly the same way. So I instantiate and connect to um, Redis Pi cluster. I think it's called Redis cluster dot strict Redis or Redis cluster something. <laughs> but look at the documentation, and then I pass it into Red Pipe Connect Redis. What that allows me to do, the reason I need to connect it is because I don't always have the, the, um, the connection. Sometimes I'm passed in none into my function, and sometimes I'm passed another pipe, and so I'm looking for opportunities to combine these. And be, by, by Defining these, and, and this example right here is not a named connection, it's just a, the default. So it, um, if you only have a single connection, you know, then this is all you really need to do. But if you talk to multiple backends, then it will optimistically look, it will look at the multiple different named connections, find the right one based off of how you've defined your, your code, and then, and then execute in parallel against the different pipelines. Um, the, the different Redis clusters or, or nodes that you might be talking to. So here's an example of what I was talking about. Can you guys see the code okay? Um, so the syntax works like Redis pipe, pipeline as pipe, which is very similar to the way Redis Pi pipeline works. It gives you back, you can use the with context to give you back a pipeline object. And then you get, you, you call increment foo or, or whatever your command is, and you get back a response of whatever that is gonna be, but you can't really call it until after pipe execute. Once pipe execute has happened, then I can use it. And you can see here, when I print foo and bar, I see numbers. Now those are actually future objects, but when the print uh, function is invoked around these, the future object says, oh, I'm being printed. Here's my print representation. And so it just works. So let's see. That was, this is the slide that I, that I also wanted to share with you, the, the problem statement of like, how do I do an operation where I'm trying to create an encapsulated function 
that does an operation on a key or multiple operations on a key, and I want to pipeline both of those together, but maybe also pipeline it with some other operations of which I know nothing about. So I'm keeping the scope of the function well-defined. And you can't really do that if you, you can't return the result of this operation, so you could return some other object um, instead, but you don't really have the answer because the, the pipe that's coming in is the one that will have the answer when it calls execute. So in the Redis Pi, or the uh, red pipe solution, what I'm doing here is saying, pass in whatever you pass me, that pipe object, which could be none or could be another Redis pipe, to my pipeline function. So then I have the either a nested object or the, the top level one, depending on whether or not none was passed in. And then after that, I just do pipe execute, and I can return the ref of the incrobi operation. Um, now, that may have already, when I called pipe execute, that may have actually already gone to the database and gotten the answer back if none was passed in, but if it was a nested one, that ref is just, just the future object. With me so far? So let's see if I can. Here's the example of multiple connections. Um, so I'm, I'm instantiating two different connections to Redis and then, and, and when you instantiate these, ob these connections to Redis, the con it's actually just a wrapper around the connection pool, which uh, will lazily connect to Redis usually, depending on how you've configured it, but usually that's, that's what happens. So it's just the, the wrapper around the connection pool that says when you do pipeline execute, okay, go ahead and allocate a connection from the connection pool, talk to Redis, and then when you're done, free it back into the connection pool. So all of that is still handled inside those top two lines. And then they're just passed in as named parameters into Redis so that you can use those names for other things. Does that make sense? So here's an example of being able to, to do those operations with red pipe. So I'm trying to skip to the code examples. Oh, that's not very readable. That's unfortunate. So I, I have a class that extends red pipe hash. That's the top line that you can't see. Um, but it's a beer class, a key space B, because I want to keep my key spaces really short. And then um, I'm defining the fields. So this is the data types that I was telling you about. So I'm, I'm using a hash, but I'm declaring certain fields um, now, if I don't declare them, they're just string fields. Uh, so I don't, I, I don't have to declare all of the fields that might be used in my hash. I can just use, declare the ones that I actually need to type differently than maybe the default one that I've set. Um, and I believe the default one actually is just a, a UTF-8 uh, encoded string, so a Unicode string. Um, and then here's my encapsulation. Now, usually I write object-oriented um, encapsulation methods for, for this kind of stuff, but I wanted to keep the example simple. So what I'm doing here is just a function that says get beer, and uh, it will go ahead and uh, inc increment the consumed quantity and then return back the beer object. So um, there's also a handy function here called auto exec, which will automatically uh, execute without me having to explicitly do it when it executes the, the pipeline context. So there's the, the two examples where I pipeline both of those together um, so that it's a single network operation to do both of those functions. And then I print them both and there's, there's the example of, of what gets printed out. Does that make sense so far? So here's an example of a struct, which I mentioned briefly. It's very similar in definition to um, how I defined my, my earlier hashes, um, but with, the, with a slightly different uh, object-oriented interface. So you type you know, the different fields that you care about in your, in your struct. You don't have to include any of them, or you can, so there's, we're still assuming, kind of Redis-like, that 
your application is responsible for maintaining the rules about what values exist in the field. There's no concept of like, okay, I'm gonna kill you if you didn't define the name field or something else. So your application logic still needs to be responsible for defining that. I could have tried to put that into it. It would have made the library way more complex. And ultimately, it's still up to your application to kind of be able to control that anyway. So I'm leaving that to your application. Uh, this is an example of what it looks like. So I do Jack and Jill. Um, I'm passing in a dictionary in this case to each of them to, to define them. And the way it works is it, um, when the pipe executes, it, it writes those dictionary values into the hash according to the definitions that I defined. Um, the UID field, if we go back one slide, you can see the key name UID uh, field right there. And so that is a mapping that says, this is the, the pretty name that I'm giving for the, the long hash. So if I have UID, a UID of one, the key name would be U curly brace and a one in the middle, if that makes sense. Um, but all I have to do in this case is pass in a one or a two, and it looks like I did a, a typo there. So they're both gonna wind up in the same, they're gonna overwrite each other. And that's actually a useful example. It was not intended, but what would happen in this case is, is Jack would actually overwrite, or Jill would overwrite Jack because it comes second. Um, they would both happen in the same pipeline and come back. And so this ac example, the way it's written right now, would actually print out Jill, Jill. <laughs> and so this, this test would fail because I, I failed to specify a different UUID, UIDs there. Uh, you can use whatever string you want for those IDs. Uh, so that's completely up to your application. Uh, there are a lot of really good libraries out there that do cool things like creating indexes for you. Um, I decided not to go that route and give you something that's closer to Redis Pi with a little, little bit of syntactic sugar and allow you to figure out how to build your own Redis's. Now, uh, your, your, own, um, your own ORM, basically, on top of Redis. Um, that's what we tended to do. We use a lot of sorted sets uh, to be able to build indexes for different things and look at quick lookups. Uh, and decoupling those is actually pretty useful because then you can do interesting things rather than in, in terms of pipelining, being able to look up multiple indexes in parallel. So here's, here's another example of how you fetch them. So if I pass a dictionary in, it's going to write those values to Redis. If I pass in a string value to that first argument, then it's going to, um, it's going to look them up by key and return me back an object. So it'll just do the get part of the operation. Um, when you pass in a dictionary, it will write the values, like I said, but it also does the get internally. So you supply the U UID field. Um, it's, it's going to overlay the, it's gonna do the update first and then the get in the same pipeline so that you get back the whole object or depending on how you've defined it, you can also specify what fields you specifically want rather than all of the fields in the hash. So if you have a really big hash, you can define the objects in different ways to say, actually most of the time I only want these set of fields, so just return these, or I always want all of the fields, or I can pass in a list of just the fields that I want. But ultimately, after that, the object that is returned behaves like a dictionary. You can treat it like a dictionary um, and grab different values out of it. Uh, you can do update, which the dictionary object in Python has, where you pass in a dictionary and it overlays on top of it with the added ability to be able to pipeline multiple of those together, if that makes sense. Okay. This is a better example of the, the callbacks that I was talking about earlier. So um, what you'll wanna do here is when, when you, well, first let me explain what the, the point of this function is. I can pass in a list of keys and increment all of them. This is really just a dumb example to show that you can create a future object yourself and do an operation on the results when they come back. So, in this particular case, results comes back, 
um, from, from incrementing all of those. I don't know if the execute has actually happened. I can't know because they may have pa passed in a, a nested pipeline here to my function, but I can define a callback that says what to do with that function, with the results of that function when it happens. So I build something, I say, future, here's the set. Yes? Sure. It's 145. Okay. Yes, I think this is really my last slide, so um, good timing. But, um, but ex this allows you to sum the results or, or do pretty much any kind of uh, arbitrary operation on the result of the data after the pipeline has executed. And so this is the, the last step that allows you to do that encapsulation and be able to do other operations on the data that you need to. Uh, with that, I believe, that's the, the bulk of my presentation. So if anyone has any questions, I'd be happy to take them. Otherwise, have a great, great rest of the session. <laughs>